I'm going to make a smart comment about uh, so being we great. are live. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is Amy Smith. I'm the chair of the Urban Forestry Commission. We are here for our June meeting. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start with introductions. Um, as I said, I'm Amy Smith. I'm the chair. So let's call around the room, starting with the commission members. So Don. Hi, Don Chavez, um, director of Asheville Greenworks and Urban Forestry Commission member. Thank you. And I'll go on the order. I see you all. So just be ready. Sharon. Uh, Sharon, Urban Forestry Commission member and TRC representative. And Ed. Ed Macy, Urban Forestry Commission. Karen. Karen Young, Urban Forestry Commission. Thank you. Cecil. Uh, Cecil Bothwell. Um, Council liaison to the, the Tree Commission for eight years and now on the Urban Forestry Commission. Thank you. Um, I don't see Zoe. She said she might be a moment late. Um, so one, we have enough to get started, but Zoe will be here and Patrick is absent today. Patrick Gilbert will not be here. And so we have some city staff with us. You want to introduce yourselves, Haley? Hi, I'm Haley Mahoney, Planning Technician with Development Services and Staff Assistant for the Urban Forestry Commission. Thank you. And Nancy? Hi, Nancy Watford, Stormwater Supervisor and Staff Liaison to Urban Forestry Commission. Thank you. Uh, ben? Good afternoon, everybody. Ben Woody, Director of Development Services. And let's see, Ricky? Ricky Hurley, Zoning Supervisor with Development Services. Thank you. And Chris? Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Collins with Development Services. All right, thanks. Uh, and we're just introducing ourselves. So if you can hear me, Kim Roney, do you want to introduce yourself? Good afternoon, Kim Roney, Asheville City Council, liaison to the Urban Forestry Commission. Glad to be here with you today. Well, thanks. So I think I got everybody except for we have two presenters, special guests with us today. So if you all want to introduce yourself, I can start with Phyllis. Hi, everybody. I'm Phyllis Stiles. I'm a, a GreenWorks board member and I'm the founder and uh, director emerita of B City USA. And I'm delighted to be with you today. Thank you. And Renee. Hi, I'm Renee Fortner. I'm the Watershed Resources Manager at Riverlink. And thank you for having me here today. All right, well, thank you to everyone for being here. As a reminder, since we are virtual, if you could please mute your microphone when you're not speaking to avoid feedback and um, unmute when you're ready to speak. Uh, we will start, um, oh, with call to order of the meeting and then approval of the minutes from last month. So. They're linked in the agenda, the action minutes, if everyone had a chance to review them. And we've seen a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. In a second. I'll second. Thank you. So we'll do a roll call vote. I'll go in the order of my list here, starting with Dawn. Yay. Ed. Aye. Sharon. Aye. Cecil. You're on mute, Cecil, if you could unmute. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> I Thank you. And Perrin? Due to my absence, I will abstain. Okay. Um, just, you know, when abstaining is a yes vote. And I vote aye. So the minutes are approved. Do we have any public comment today? Let me check real quick. We did not receive any prior to the meeting. Let me see if I have anybody on the line though. Let's see, we do not have any callers on the line. All right, thank you. Um, we do not have any alternative compliance on the agenda, so we're gonna start directly with presentations. So beginning with Phyllis and the Bees and Trees presentation. So I'm not sure if you're sharing your own screen, if you have slides, yeah. then go ahead and take over. Thank you, Amy. Um, okay. I won't be able to see you, unfortunately, as I do this. So uh, just hang with me. <laughs> Thanks so much for this opportunity. Um, what I'm hoping to do today is to debunk some myths around trees and pollinators. 
The first myth, trees aren't important to pollinator habitat because the best forage for pollinators is in a sunny pollinator meadow. The second myth, adult female bees collect pollen for developing babies, uh, but adult bees, especially males, don't eat pollen themselves. Third, bees prefer heavy sticky pollen and don't collect lightweight pollen from trees and other plants that are wind pollinated, especially conifers. And lastly, conifers don't host moth and butterfly caterpillars, all myths. Um, so back in 2007, colony collapse disorder was just headline news around the world everybody was asking the question, oh my goodness, what would we do without the honeybees? This brought together uh, a task force of the UN in 2016, almost 100 scientists around the world were charged with making policy recommendations to all the countries around the world about what to do about the pollinator declines that the planet was experiencing. And one aspect of that report was that 40% of insect pollinator species are at risk, risk of extinction right now. As part of that work, they pulled together all of the literature they could find about pollinators and pollination. And they created this graph on just how much literature existed. And as you can see, there's been a steep increase since about 2000 and it just keeps going up, up, up because we've got to play catch up when it comes to what's going on with our pollinators. Um, this famous article came out in the New York Times Magazine about the insect apocalypse and the easiest way to um, uh, understand the difference in just the past couple of decades is to think about if you're old enough to remember how much we had to clean the, the dead insects off of our windshields in our cars and how infrequently we have to do that now. That's how many insects we've lost, both in abundance and diversity. Uh, America's bumblebees illustrate the point very well. 28% 20, of our 47 indigenous bumblebee species are at risk of extinction right now. And most famously, the rusty patch bumblebee, which used to be really common here in Western North Carolina, its range has shrunk from 28 down to 10 states just in the past two decades. And it was the first bee in the continental United States to be added to the endangered species list. So what's at stake when we're talking about pollinator decline? Well, about 90% of our flowering plant species rely on them for reproduction and many other species, including our own, rely on those plants for food and shelter. They are indeed a keystone species. Uh, birds and mammals depend on fruits and seeds that result from insect pollination. One in three bites is thanks to a bee. This is a whole foods produce section. And when Xerces Society uh, worked with them to remove everything that relied on the pollination services of bees, this is what the produce section looked like. And recent research shows that without the pollinators, 71 million people may be at risk for vitamin A deficiency, 173 million for folate, folate deficiency, and global mortality could increase by 1.41 million deaths per year. What the report talked about too, the UN report, was that biodiversity is our global sustainability insurance. Less is not more, more is better. Greater species number and larger population sizes give ecosystems a better chance of survival in the face of climate change. So that's basically why we started Bee City USA back in 2012 when Asheville City Council unanimously voted, and thank you Cecil Bothwell, you were a huge part of that, uh, to be the first Bee City USA in the nation. Our mission is galvanizing communities to sustain pollinators by increasing the abundance of native plants, providing nest sites, and reducing the use of pesticides. 
And that's a beautiful bumblebee and a squash blossom in that picture. In 2015, we expanded to include uh, university campuses. And right here, we have UNC Asheville, the North Carolina Arboretum, Warren Wilson College, and Blue Ridge Community College among the uh, many B campuses across the country. In 2018, we merged with the Xerces Society in Portland, Oregon. Uh, they have the largest pollinator conservation program in the world. They have offices spread out across the country and they have tons and tons of resources, which I can't recommend enough to you. In the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand and we will understand only what we are taught. So as I said before, we are all playing catch up and that's why that learning curve uh, the graph that I showed you is so steep. We have a lot to learn. And that's a beautiful squash bee and a zucchini blossom. That's a male waiting for the females to come along. We have a green metallic sweat bee here. Our mantra from the very beginning was never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And here is proof of that because in all 300 B city and B campus affiliates now, uh, their work was started by a, a small group of thoughtful committed citizens and we're so grateful to them. We hope to get all 50 states on board uh, before too long. So who are these magnificent pollinators? Well, the oldest pollinator in the world are the beetles. There's 400,000 species of them and that beetle is on a magnolia flower then we have the flies, 110,000 species. We're not talking about common house flies, but there are so many of them, and we can thank them for chocolate. The moths, we don't get to see them very much because they're mostly nocturnal. 160,000 of them in the world, known species. Uh, and then their uh, descendants, the butterflies, came along later, 17,500 species. They mostly uh, come out in the daytime and many of them are migratory. Then the hummingbirds, we're so lucky to have them because they're just in the Western hemisphere, about 300 of them, uh, and their beaks have evolved with the flowers that they pollinate. Their tongues are often as long as their bodies uh, and many, many of them are migratory. And lastly, we have the bats. 1,400 species, there are eastern bats are not pollinators, but in desert areas and tropical areas, they're extremely important pollinators. And that bat you see there is not yellow, that's pollen. There's 20,000 species of bees in the world and only seven of them are actually considered honeybees. And that one that you're looking at is a bumblebee. The bees are considered the most important pollinators in the temperate zones, but we value all of our pollinators. But I'm going to tell you a little bit why we consider the bees the most important for the temperate zones as, as I can uh, continue with the presentation. So trees, that's the topic today, they provide floral resources. And I want to show you bees in action. These are sweat bees. And you can actually see them pulling the pollen off and packing it on their back legs. Her legs are so covered in pollen that it's kind of miraculous that she can move or fly. And she's collecting pollen. These are all uh, different varieties of sweat bees, which are much smaller than honeybees. And we don't get to see them up close like this very often. And here comes probably a little mining bee or something off to the side of the screen. Um, so I just wanted to see what they look like when they're pollinating and when they're collecting pollen. And it's their only source of protein. That's why it's so important to the bees and why they're considered the most important pollinators in the temperate world. Pollination is in fact plant sex. These plants rely on the pollinators to transfer the pollen, which is the male sperm, to the female part of the flower where the ovaries are. Just a quick botany primer, gymnosperms that were around in the days of the dinosaurs don't produce flowers or fruit and they don't need a pollinator's help to reproduce. The trees that are gymnosperms are generally called softwoods like pine trees. 
Angiosperms, by contrast, do produce flowers, and nearly 90% of them need a pollinator's help to reproduce. Their trees are generally called hardwoods. Both angiosperm and gymnosperm plants produce pollen, and 80% of uh, plants are angiosperms. So Cass Urban Mead up at Cornell University, she's a postdoc, has been doing research for the past three years to see what kind of pollen uh, the bees in the apple orchards are producing or, or collecting, I'm sorry. And so she found that 30 to 40% of the pollen on the bees legs in the apple orchard was actually from neighboring forest trees. Many of those trees wind pollinated, even excuse me, pine trees. And she also found when she put traps up in the top of those trees and she dissected the bees and looked at the pollen in the stomachs of the bees up in the tree tops, that both male and female adult bees were collecting pollen in the forest up in the tree tops, where we don't get to see very often. We don't really know what's going on up in those tree tops. And that's why, um, it's a myth that uh, we need pollinator meadows if we want to support pollinators and we don't talk about trees a whole lot. We, we just didn't know what was going on up there in the treetops. So I wanna give you one example of pollination ecology uh, just to drive the point home that flowers and their pollinators have worked out these relationships over millions of years and so this wild tobacco plant that grows out in the Southwest is a host plant for moths, for many kinds of hawk moths. So the hawk moth is attracted to the plant and in an unusual circumstance, the hawk moth is also attracted to the nectar of the wild tobacco flower. So when their babies hatch out of their eggs and they start devouring the leaves of the um, tobacco plant, the tobacco plant gets pretty nervous and switches the time that it releases its pollen from the evening about six o'clock to the morning about six o'clock, right when the hummingbirds are migrating north up from Central America and South America. And the hummingbirds are really loving that nectar in that uh, wild tobacco flower, but they're not eating the leaves and the uh, wild tobacco plant says, problem solved. I've taken care of the issue of my leaves being devoured, but it supported both the hawk moths and the hummingbirds in doing what it did. That's pretty, pretty amazing that this plant can turn its nectar off and on uh, just by deciding itself um, what's, what's happening to its leaves. So what if we imagined a day in the life of a pollinator beyond our flower beds up in the treetops? Wherever they have pollen or nectar or both flowering trees are meadows in the sky for pollinators. And remember that lesson about angiosperms. Flowers can be really subtle and they don't have to have nectar to be flowering. So let's talk about that a little bit. Trees are preferable to bees and other pollinators because they offer greater food density. There are more flowers within a relatively small area on a blooming tree compared with flower meadows. This makes trees a more efficient foraging ground for bees and scientists have found bees show preference to trees, collecting a large proportion of their diet from woody species. I want you to see this little mason bee mother um, if I can get it, there we go. She's a spring tree nectar collector. She'll make a cell out of masonry. That's why she's called a mason bee. She'll go out and collect lots of pollen and then she'll unload that pollen in this masonry cell that she's made. And when she thinks she has enough, she'll lay an egg on it and she'll seal up that cell and she'll start with the next cell, the next cell. And so she, always builds nests in some sort of cavity. This is a man-made cavity, but she'll do it in beetle burrows. They'll even do it in small hose pipes. Um, and they carry their pollen underneath their abdomens, unlike most bees. 
So <clears throat> let's just take a look at a few of the famous blooming trees we have in our areas with what we think of as flowers with nectar and pollen. The tulip tree is very poplar. A lot of people call them poplar trees. They're not really poplar trees, but they have plentiful nectar. And so they attract all kinds of pollinators. But interestingly enough, because they have that big open flowers like the magnolia flower, um, and I think they're actually part of the magnolia family, beetles are their primary pollinator. And of course, of course they're one of the host plants for tiger swallowtail caterpillars. American basswood, another really wonderful blooming uh, tree, um, and it attracts all kinds of pollinators. But interestingly, its primary pollinator is a, um, a moth because its nectar production peaks in the late afternoon. Sourwood, our most famous honey is sourwood honey around here. Um, and so the honeybees obviously love the nectar of the sourwood tree, but so do many other kinds of pollinators, and it hosts 14 moth species. But here's the, the myth-busting news. Nectar is pollinator bee bait, but bees collect pollen from wind-pollinated trees that have absolutely no nectar, which mostly bloom in the spring when most bees need the pollen the most. So all beekeepers know about how important the maple trees are that bloom in early spring for the pollen when the honeybees are trying to build up their hives. But we didn't really realize how important even the oak trees are for the pollen uh, that it offers bees, spring bees particularly. In addition to floral resources, trees provide lots of leaves. So if you ever see leaves like this, where little discs have been cut out around the edges, you know that a leaf cutter bee has been there. And we know that they like maple and redbud tree leaves, but they also like um, other leaf sources. And that's what a leaf cutter bee does, I mean, looks like. And as you can see, her abdomen is covered in pollen, just like the mason bees. And so they are the two bee uh, groups that put pollen on their abdomens instead of their legs. Lepidoptera babies love their greens, and so they're reliant on trees as well as shrubs and vines uh, and other plants for their caterpillars. We all know about the butterfly moth life cycle. It starts with an egg. They hatch out and become a larva, also called a caterpillar and then they transform into a chrysalis or if they're a moth into a cocoon, they pupate and they become an adult moth or a caterpillar. So they have different needs at, depending on where they are in their life cycle. They don't need nectar until they're an adult uh, moth or caterpillar, I mean, moth or butterfly. We can thank Doug Tallamy for spreading this news about how important the trees are for so many butterfly and moth species. So if you look at the oak right at the top of his list, of course, there are a lot of different species of oak and all those species taken together, the whole oak genus supports 534 different kinds of butterflies and moths. And you go down the list and it descends from there. Black cherry is another really, really important genus, 456 butterfly and moth species. He's written two more books, Nature's Best Hope and The Nature of Oaks, and I can't recommend those books enough. And we're hoping he's going to be here this fall, either live in person or by Zoom uh, at a, Nor at a um, North Carolina Arboretum Symposium. Let's talk about oaks a little more. Uh, they offer lots of leaves for hungry caterpillars. And they bloom in the spring when spring bees like bumblebee queens are establishing their colonies or nests and they need lots of pollen. And so on our um, Asheville Bee City list that Greenworks maintains on its website, we have four oak species listed that work real well in our landscapes. You see them there, the northern red, white, pin, and swamp white. And uh, they host a heck of a lot of moths and butterflies in their caterpillars phase. Here are some other trees that uh, just bring the point home about how important the leaves are. Uh, the pawpaw trees support the zebra swallowtail butterfly. 
and they're pollinated by beetles and flies because their strange little flowers are pretty stinky. They smell like rotting flesh. And so that's what beetles and flies love. So uh, that's why we get that beautiful pawpaw fruit. Sassafras trees are, import, are important to a lot of different pollinators. And of course, the spice bush swallowtail uses the sassafras among some other species uh, for its caterpillars. Red bud blooms first and then the leaves appear afterwards. We all love to see those red buds, red buds come in the spring. Um, I like to show this picture from my yard. Uh, a little kid pointed out this caterpillar to me on a red bud leaf and uh, it drives home the point of not only can we not see what's happening up in the treetops, but because these critters are such masters of camouflage, uh, we often miss them when they're right in front of our faces. This happens to be a morning glory prominent moth on a red bud leaf. And it's thanks to all those caterpillars that we have the birds that we do because their baby birds can't eat hard shelled things. They can't eat nuts and seeds. They need soft tissue to digest it. And so when scientists put cameras on a chickadee nest, they've done this numerous times and they've counted all the caterpillars the mom and dad bring back to their, their baby birds. It ranges from five to 10,000 caterpillars that they have to collect, if you can believe that, before those babies finally fledge. And we know that 90% of terrestrial birds rely on butterfly and moth caterpillars for their baby food. Our evergreen trees are vital for moths and butterflies. The American holly hosts 39 moth and butterfly species, as well as supplying pollen and nectar to a variety of bees, beetles, wasps, flies, and butterflies. And then the eastern red cedar, the white pine, and the hemlock all host a variety of moths and butterflies. Trees also provide habitat for pollinators. Famously, the monarch butterflies fly sometimes from as far as Canada to Mexico because they need certain conditions in order to survive the winter. And those oil mill fir forests at high elevations provide just that perfect environment for them. But right here in um, our own yards, uh-oh. Well, and let me show you, what did I do? Oh, okay. Right here in our own yards, we can help these critters overwinter and nest. If we just leave our leaf litter in the fall, we don't have it hauled off. All kinds of things are living in that leaf litter from bumblebee queens to moths, butterflies, fireflies. We sure love our fireflies. And beetles, slugs, centipedes, spiders, you, you name it. They have to have leaf litter. But for this talk, I really want to drive home that 94% of moths pupate in or under leaf litter during the winter. Just like these hummingbird clearwing moths I want to show you. This was on plots. I filmed this uh, just down the street from my house. It's always exciting when you see a hummingbird clearwing moth. And I want you to look at her proboscis and how expert she is at just sending that white proboscis down to the center of every flower. And that's why these moths are the primary pollinator of flock species. Nobody does it better. And she overwintered in leaf litter. Dead branches and tree snags provide nesting and overwintering habitat for beetles and bees. So we really encourage people to try to keep that in their yards. Um, if you wanna just uh, keep it off in a corner where it's not front, it's not uh, center stage, that's fine. Or a tree snag, if you just leave it standing until it falls over, you are supporting lots of pollinators. In 2021, we convened a Blue Ribbon Task Force at Asheville Greenworks to update our Bee City Asheville plant list and now with all this new information about how important trees are, we added a lot more trees. This is just one of the pages about trees. Uh, I want you to notice that we have the scientific and common names when they flower and their value to pollinators. 
And then the last column is who locally supplies those trees. And each species is linked mostly to the North Carolina plant toolbox, where you can learn a lot, lot more about each species. This is just another page of um, our tree list. So in summary, if all the bees were to go out marching on behalf of pollinators and they carried their little signs saying, what do we want? When do we want it? They might say something like this, during the growing season, they want nectar for bees, butterflies, moths, wasps, flies, and hummingbirds. They want pollen for bees and beetles, and they want living leaves for butterflies, moths, and leaf cutter bees. Uh, and then they want leaf litter in the fall and winter for bees, butterflies, and moths for overwintering. And they want dead branches and tree snags for cavity nesting beetles and bees all year for nesting and overwintering. So if we want sustainability and resilience, biodiversity is absolutely key. And since we know that nearly 90% of flowering plants rely on pollinators to reproduce, then they are key to biodiversity. Tree diversity depends on pollinator diversity and vice versa. At least a quarter of our 20,000 bee species specialize on certain pollens and most butterflies and moths have specific larval host plants. In fact, there's a European bee that specializes on a certain kind of oak pollen. And when we say that, we mean that's the only pollen that that bee will collect for her offspring. Lastly, native trees and other native plants support native pollinators and they are well adapted to local conditions. Therefore, they don't require as much pampering. So you ask yourself, which species expend, is expendable as we're witnessing such mass, um, mass uh, extinctions right now? Do we want to lose this incredible little Sarura vinula moth? It's just stunningly beautiful. I just can't imagine the world without this little moth caterpillar. So we want to keep as many species as we possibly can. So please add conserving pollinators and biodiversity generally to the long list of reasons we should preserve tree diversity and abundance. Some resources to share, certainly our plant list at the Asheville Greenworks website. Uh, it was informed by the Federal Highway Administration's eco-regional revegetation uh, database that you can get at that link. Um, the North, Air, North Carolina Extension Gardener Plant Toolbox is just a gem. I was so impressed when they released that to the public. It is dynamite and they just keep making it better and better. It's loaded with all kinds of pollinator information. And of course, bcdusa.org and xerces.org. Uh, I wanna point out on that uh, Federal Highway Administration database, it has 47 columns and I just want you to take a look at those columns. It's amazing the amount of information they provide, which is so valuable for city development departments. And I imagine those of you on this uh, call actually know about this list. I did not, and I just, I can't tell you uh, what a resource it is. And that last column with all the pollinator information Xerces Society helped them develop that. So it's really rich as well. Lastly, we're celebrating our 10th anniversary. Thank you, Cecil. And, uh, and I was so glad, Kim, I know you're on this call. I was so glad you're gonna come to our pollinator safari this Saturday. We are celebrating all year long with tons of different kinds of events, all fun and educational. And you can find the calendar of events on Greenworks website. So with that, um, I'm gonna, uh, I think I can exit out of this. There we go. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen somehow. Um, did it work, Haley? Am I sharing my screen still? No, we are back um, Back to just uh, seeing everyone on the screen, but okay. no, no presentation. Okay. All right, thank you so much. And uh, I would love to answer questions if there's time. We have a couple minutes if there are any questions. Excellent job, Phyllis, thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. All right, Cecil, I think I have a question. 
Um, I, I thank you for your thanks, Phyllis, but uh, you are the poster person for one person can change the world. Oh, very thank kind you. of you. <laughs> thank you. Ed, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Phil, that was a great presentation. And uh, you actually left me with more questions and answers, which um, shows how, how effective it was. Uh, I was curious, so um, you mentioned that the hemlock tree is provides pollination habitat for some, I can't remember the, the number, 30 or 40 some odd pollinators. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head. It might have been 14, but you're, you're probably right, Ed. It was a bunch, but um, so losing hemlock um, from the adelgid, do you, are they able to find other trees? Is there a, a niche replacement for some of these pollinators or are they just in trouble because of that? Um, you know, I need, what a great question. And I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, when we first started Bee City, uh, we were housed with the tree commission. And um, when folks on the commission and I see Cecil uh, shaking his head, asked me, well, do we need to worry about the hemlocks in relation to the pollinators? And I said, oh, no, 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 no. Um, they're of no concern to us. But that learning curve, I'm right on that learning curve. I didn't know. And uh, I'm a big fan of uh, hemlocks. It's one of our beloved native trees that we want to keep around. And so in my own yard, I treat them with neonicotinoids and metacloprid um, to preserve the trees from the woolly adelgid. Now, uh, that kills all the insects that visit a, a hemlock tree. It absolutely will. There's no way they can survive that insecticide. Uh, I'm pretty sure. So to your question, you know, then what happens to those species of moths and butterflies uh, I would have to look at each species and find out what their host plants are to see if they have alternatives. And I haven't done that research yet. So I, I might take a look at that. Yeah, one more comment to that. Um, the imidacropolid is, is, kills the adelgid when the adelgid pierces the needles and starts sucking the sap. And pollinators may not get poisoned by picking up pollen from, from the tree. So it may actually not be as bad as it sounds. No, I think they do, they and do. Um, yeah. and it permeates the whole tree, is my understanding. And you, you uh, plant experts know more about this than I do. So certainly, those moths and uh, butterfly caterpillars on that tree are going to be munching on those leaves, those uh, needles, or, and they're going to get the insecticide. Mm. Well, well, this all underscores, you know, the importance of taking a systems approach in our thinking with how we manage our resources, even at the most localist scale, our backyards, um, kind of getting away from the idea of lawns and thinking snag trees are really okay if they're safe and leaving the leaf, leaf litter and things like that. So um, it's a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Renee, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Phyllis. I learned a lot. Uh, I'm picturing some signage like you see at the base of a tree with the Latin name and the common name and then supports and maybe highlighting a few pollinators that that tree supports because I feel like a lot of people aren't aware of how important tree flowers are for pollinators. I love that idea. Oh my gosh. Because we're all on a learning curve. I mean, the scientists too, I, I pointed out Cass Urban Mead's research at Cornell. I mean, this is cutting edge research. It's, you always think that somebody knew all of this stuff. Well, no, we've got, we've got a lot to learn. Okay. Phyllis, that was fantastic. I really enjoyed your presentation and the the zeal that you you put into your advocacy for these pollinators. Um, so, uh, do you know about on June fourteenth the city council meeting about the where we can advocate for an urban forester and an urban forest master plan to be included in this in the budget for the coming year? 
I do. And we're also doing a proclamation for uh, B City USA at that same meeting. Great, great. Well, I just thought um, if you have an extra, you know, 10 seconds to throw the point in there that um, if we want to stay B, B City USA, we have to keep our tree canopy. And if we want to keep our tree canopy, we have to plan to keep it. And if we want to plan to keep it, we have to come up with a plan and have staff to support that. So um, I, I'd love it if you would throw in a plug for that while you're at the meeting on the 14th. Oh, thank you. I, I appreciate that suggestion. I think that would be perfect. All right. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and cut off the questions for now. We have another presentation, but thank you so much, Phyllis. And obviously I agree with everyone that this highlighted how interconnected our work is with um, you know, the rest of the ecology of our area. So thank you. Thank and you feel so free to much. hang out for the next presentation if you like. Uh, otherwise, we appreciate your time. So we're going to hand it over to Renee Fortner with Riverlink. And I don't know if you're running your own presentation or uh, if we're helping or if you're just chatting. Sorry, Renee, you're muted. Yes, I'm going to share my screen and run the presentation. How is that? Does everyone see my intro slide? Yeah, looks good. Thank you. Great. Thank you for having me here today. I'm a big fan of the Urban Forestry Commission. And today I'm here to talk about the work that Riverlink and our partners are doing to restore the Central Asheville watershed. And just briefly, uh, Riverlink, we're a local environmental nonprofit that promotes the environmental and economic vitality of the French Broad River watershed, of which trees make up a large portion of our watershed. So um, there's we have a lot of shared goals with the Urban Forestry Commission. Um, and today I'm going to talk a lot about green stormwater infrastructure uh, and trees are are essentially green green infrastructure. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to focus in on an area of Asheville that we've been working in uh, intensively over the last couple years. And we refer to this area as the Central Asheville Watershed. And this map, you can see the city of Asheville city limits highlighted in yellow, and the Central Asheville Watershed is highlighted in red. So this area drains into a very popular section of the French Broad River as it flows but, uh, through the River Arts District. Just some fun facts about the watershed. It's about two square miles in area. Um, and that means within this two square miles, all of the water that lands on the ground uh, eventually drains to the same location. Uh, there are three main tributary streams of the French Broad River in this watershed. And those are Bacote Branch, Town Branch, also known locally as Nasty Branch, and Haith Branch. Uh, both Bacote Branch and Town Branch are listed as impaired for having bacteria levels that exceed state water quality standards. Um, this section of the French Broad River is also, has also been listed as impaired as of this year, uh, 2022, for, um, for high fecal coliform bacteria levels. Uh, another important thing to note about this watershed is that it in terms of land cover, the average uh, land cover is 44% impervious surfaces. So that means these are hard surfaces that prevent water from soaking into the ground. And I, I will also note that in some areas of the watershed, uh, downtown, for example, you, you'll see more like 95% impervious areas. Uh, in August of 2020, we completed a watershed restoration plan for this area. Uh, this was led by Blue Earth Planning, Engineering, and Design. And we spent a year-long 
Well, this was the result of a year long study looking at what are the water quality issues in those three streams that I just mentioned? Uh, where are the sources of pollution? And we developed um, a list of projects and initiatives to help address these pollution sources. And we've been working since 2020 to uh, formalize partnerships and acquire funding to implement the recommendations in the watershed plan. And so I'm going to talk today about one of the, the, the main overarching recommendations, which is for more green stormwater infrastructure to tackle the pollution sources, uh, as well as I'll talk about a specific project that was recommended in the plan that we are uh, working to implement. And so, uh, yeah, the watershed plan, as I mentioned, we looked at the sources of impairment in the streams and because it's an urban watershed and there are so many impervious surfaces in this area, it wasn't surprising to us that stormwater runoff rose to the top of the list as uh, the major source of water quality issues, followed by bacteria, uh, sediment pollution, primarily from erosion. So this would be stream bank erosion, uh, sediment leaving you know, construction sites. There's a lot of aging infrastructure in Asheville, and that includes a lot of our culverts and uh, stormwater infrastructure. And then within the River Arts District in particular, you know, we have a lot of former industrial sites, brownfield sites that you know, have legacy pollution that continues to impact these streams. So out of this planning process came 75 projects and initiatives that are proposed to address these impairments. And we estimate uh, between five and $10 million investment is needed over the next decade to, uh, you know, not to restore these streams to a health that you might see in a, a waterway in Pisgah National Forest, but just to prevent further uh, decline in the health of the streams and in the habitats and, and the wildlife that they support. Uh, to date, uh, Riverlink has secured around three quarters of a million dollars to implement the plan. Uh, so we have a long way to go and we're hoping to, you know, keep, keep the momentum going and, you know, as you all know, um, with future development in Asheville and, and in this watershed in particular, we looked at, uh, you know, future development predictions for this watershed uh, based on city of Asheville plans, uh, taking climate change into consideration. You know, the bad news is that we can expect more stormwater runoff impacting these waterways. Um, I included these two images because they were just really dramatic uh, instances of how stormwater runoff is impacting these streams. On the left is a photo I took of Town Branch, you know, during a normal rain. It wasn't a, a huge like tropical storm event. And this culvert is near Choctaw Street and uh, the sediment plume in the brown uh, was actually ended up being a runoff from a construction strat, a construction site further upstream, whose their their erosion control measures were um, not working well, and then there's this milky white color. It's very mysterious. Appears in Town Branch periodically during rains, and no one seems to know where that originates from. Uh, sometimes it's an inky black discoloration in the stream. And then the image on the right is a, a large gully that's about between 10 and 15 foot deep on the campus of AB Tech. Uh, and this is caused by stormwater runoff that originates on campus parking lots and uh, some old school engineering that piped the runoff directly into the forest out of sight and out of mind. And this is what it has caused over the last couple decades. And, um, the erosion from this gully uh, eventually leads into Haith Branch and then into the French Broad River. And engineers have estimated that at least 20 tons of sediment leave this site uh, on an annual basis and enters the French Broad River. So what are we going to do? What can we do? Um, as I mentioned before, 
The major recommendation in the watershed plan was for more green infrastructure and low impact development because these will address the stormwater runoff issues. And these photos are of um, the Green Streets project along Craven Street. This was a city of Asheville initiative that Riverlink partnered uh, with the city on to get some grant funding to implement these stormwater features. But uh, this is in front of New Belgium Brewery. Many of you have probably seen this. You have uh, bioswells on the left and permeable paving on the right. And uh, these features capture runoff from Craven Street, allow it to soak into the ground where pollutants are filtered out um, before it reaches the French Broad River. So this is a wonderful example of a green infrastructure project in the city of Asheville. Um, just briefly, uh, traditional stormwater infrastructure um, in uh, comparison to what I'm going to be talking about, the green stormwater infrastructure. So what we traditionally have throughout our city is, um, you know, all of the gutters and sidewalks and streets, the runoff is directed into a storm drain. And then that storm drain leads to a system of pipes that uh, pipe the runoff to the nearest stream. A lot of people don't realize that uh, storm drains do not lead to the, uh, the MSD plant in Woodfin where that, that water is treated. We have a separate sanitary sewer and stormwater piping system in Asheville. And that, that water goes directly into the nearest stream. So you can imagine the various pollutants that it picks up uh, along the way and, and delivers to our waterways in addition to just massive volumes of water entering our streams all at once, which exacerbates um, flooding issues. Green stormwater infrastructure, on the other hand, diverts that runoff first into features that utilize plants and soil to filter the runoff and soak it into the ground. And this, uh, this is just a nice image of what green infrastructure can look like on a residential street. And green infrastructure can be implemented at many different scales, from the small scale residential lot where a homeowner could divert the gutters from their um, rooftop into a rain garden or a cistern to a commercial parking lot uh, where uh, perhaps a large rain garden has been constructed to capture the runoff to um, a larger scale situation where maybe you're protecting existing public green space, you're creating new green space, which essentially serves as uh, green infrastructure because it's permeable and it allows that the runoff to soak into the ground where pollutants can be filtered out. And there are many benefits to green infrastructure. Um, aside from the water quality benefits, um, we have, you know, they can serve as beautiful community amenities, and help reduce flooding and erosion issues because it's keeping those large volume, large volumes of runoff out of our waterways. It can actually reduce the need or the cost for the conventional stormwater infrastructure. The trees that are planted uh, reduce the urban heat island effect. All of these things promote climate resilience, uh, creates wildlife habitat, and then there's many human health benefits, as you all know, to planting more trees and having more open green space in our urban areas. Um, just wanted to highlight one of the proposed projects in the Central Asheville Watershed Plan that I think the Urban Forestry Commission could appreciate. Um, and that is a pilot study in the downtown area where some of the um, traditional storm drain inlets are retrofitted with uh, stormwater inlet treatment systems. Um, and the recommendation is that any place that the city is planning major street and stormwater system up uh, repairs and replacement, this presents an opportunity to test one of these storm drain inlet treatment systems um, instead of installing a standard in inlet. And, you know, we propose a pilot study recognizing that 
um, the city may want to, you know, take a very measured approach by installing a few different types of inlet treatment systems and collecting data on them to see which one uh, best serves our city needs and fits within their budget and maintenance um, uh, limitations. And one of those, an example of a storm drain inlet treatment system could be uh, a silva cell system. Um, many of you may be familiar with this type of system, but um, you know, basically a below, below ground infrastructure that allows for um, the maximum amount of uh, soil media to be placed beneath some sort of permeable paver or a great system that allows the, the stormwater to infiltrate. Uh, these are planted with trees. So the silva cell structure not only increases the amount of soil and the, the volume of runoff that could be captured, but it provides more room for those tree roots to expand. And uh, I'm not sure if, uh, I'm sure Nancy Watford, could, she probably knows if we have any silva cell uh, treatment systems in the city of Asheville, but um, certainly something that, that we would like to see more of to address the stormwater runoff issue, but it would also serve to help um, help the urban forest, urban forest, um, the tree canopy. Now I just want to highlight one of the green infrastructure projects that we have gotten funding for and are working to implement, and that is the Southside Community Green Infrastructure Project. Uh, the goals of this project are to improve water quality and habitat in Nasty Branch, which flows through the Southside Community of Asheville. Um, address needs of this marginalized community and provide green jobs training. Our partner on this project is the Housing Authority of Asheville. The project is going to take place at Erskine Apartments. This is a public housing community within the Southside neighborhood. Uh, currently, there's a traditional stormwater infrastructure at this site that is designed to capture the runoff from the rooftops and parking lots and divert it into this concrete swale that you see in the photos. This concrete swale, the purpose is to get the stormwater runoff off site as quickly as possible. And it leads to a pipe that um, is directed into Nasty Branch. And so, um, there's even runoff from AB Tech campus that is collected here uh, in a stormwater pipe that then, then um, is piped into Nasty Branch. And so this project is going to retrofit the site with green stormwater infrastructure. It will replace the concrete ditch with something similar to what you see on the right. Um, this is referred to as a regenerative stormwater conveyance feature but it's basically a, a sort of a natural step pool design um, that will provide an opportunity for the stormwater runoff to collect in the pools where it can soak into the ground. So it's slowing the runoff down, giving it an opportunity to soak into the ground before, um, before it reaches nasty branch. So it's gonna filter out pollutants. Uh, this, uh, Feature is going to be planted heavily with native trees and shrubs. And then we're going to uh, expand an existing wetland on site so that it can treat a larger volume of runoff. Uh, there's going to be a walking trail constructed around the wetland, some educational signage. And both of these features are not only going to help improve water quality by better addressing the stormwater runoff on the site, but they're also going to provide um, a beautiful amenity for the Erskine apartment residents. Alongside the stormwater features, um, and this is another wonderful thing about green infrastructure projects, there are so many co-benefits to these types of projects. Um, alongside the stormwater features, we're also going to construct amenities for the communities so these were things that were identified by residents within the community um, as needs. And so we're going to construct safe walking paths. We're gonna remove a chain link fence that is currently 
covered in non-native invasive vines and it um, divides the community. We're going to um, install a shade structure where families can gather outdoors, create safe biking paths for the kids. Residents have re requested a memorial garden to honor loved ones that have been lost to violence and lots of edible native plants, including trees and shrubs. We're also excited to partner with Green Opportunities, the local workforce development uh, organization that is based in the Southside community. We're going to partner with them to try uh, provide green jobs training as part of the construction of the project. Um, and we're really excited to be to work with them. And so with that, I just want to circle back to the Central Asheville watershed plan itself and note that, um, you know, once we complete the Southside Community Stormwater Project, we can check that one off the list and we only have 74 more projects and initiatives to go. So that is to say that, you know, we have a long way to go towards um, implementing this plan to uh, improve and protect uh, water quality and habitat within the central Asheville watershed. And just, um, you know, maybe to point out the obvious, but this small two square mile watershed is just a mere microcosm of the greater Asheville area. And the problems that we're seeing in these urban streams are not unique to this part of Asheville. I think if you were to look at Sweeten Creek, Hominy Creek, Dingle Creek, um, Moore Branch, all of these streams would have similar issue um, in large part because of the stormwater runoff problems. So we know we need more green infrastructure to tackle stormwater runoff and to make our city more climate resilient. So how do we get there? Well, there are multiple ways. Um, it will take, take multiple approaches, but uh, one way would be to update and strengthen the city's stormwater ordinance uh, provide incentives for private developers. We, we are aware of the fact that the city is somewhat limited in how stringent they can make their stormwater ordinance. So perhaps providing incentives for private developers to implement green infrastructure could be another way of achieving our goals. Lead by example, uh, prioritizing green infrastructure in public projects. Uh, a couple that come to mind, um, the Cox Avenue, Lexington Avenue proposed complete street, could be a green street, um, similar to what the city constructed along Craven Street in front of New Belgium. So, you know, in addition to the amazing pedestrian and biking features that will no doubt be a part of that project, uh, we, we could implement green infrastructure. We have a lot of um, affordable housing initiatives that are coming online in the near future. We should be considering partnerships and grant funding and um, ways that we can incorporate green infrastructure in, in those projects when possible. Retrofit existing sites with green infrastructure. And uh, at the residential scale, if we had enough uh, residential properties addressing runoff, uh, then it could collectively have a large impact on water quality. And so, um, you know, one of the, the barriers to implementing green infrastructure on residential properties is, is the cost to do so. So we could, we could create some public cost share program that would help offset the cost for residents to do things like install cisterns and rain gardens. That would also be beneficial and help us work towards our goal of more green infrastructure. And with that, um, yeah, thank you for your time. And if we have time, I can I can answer some questions. Thanks, Renee. That was excellent. We do have uh, just a couple minutes for questions. So it looks like Cecil, go ahead. I wanted to make a quick comment and have a question. Um, the design we had done for the pending park across from the Civic Center includes a comprehensive silva cell system. The idea is that all of the water that falls on that park will stay in that park uh, for trees. There won't be tree pits. There will be a continuous 
soil uh, system for the trees that are planted. So, I mean, it's possible. I mean, it's certainly possible that we can do this. My question was, what is the uh, what is the source of the fecal coliform bacteria, if there's any particular source? I mean, that sounds to me like sewage runoff. Well, likely a combination of leaky sewer lines. Uh, some of those could be private lines, you know, from, from the home to the street. Um, and certainly uh, fecal coliform bacteria is present, present in stormwater runoff. Um, wildlife, dog poop that doesn't get picked up off the ground, leaky dumpsters in downtown that possibly drain into storm drains. Those could, those could all be sources of fecal coliform bacteria. You know, in the French Broad River, a lot of that's coming from upstream and agricultural areas as well, you know, cows in the creek. But in our urban streams like Haith Branch and Nasty Branch and, and Bacote Branch, um, it's likely some, yeah, leak, leaky sewer lines and just runoff from the landscape. I remember when I when I moved here in 1980, they were uh, public public systems were putting dye into toilets to see if it showed up in a nearby stream. Um, I hoped we kind of limited that. <laughs> oh well. All right, Ed. Yeah. Um, well, your good presentation. Thank you. It kind of left me wondering how we can break down silos in the city. Um, so we're having conversations about in increasing our soil volume standards um, so so the tree can grow and survive better. And of course, silver, silver cells have come into that discussion. And there, there, I wouldn't say there's pushback, but there's apprehension about the costs of those systems. Um, compared to the value of trees just living longer. But when you add stormwater value and water quality value, um, then it starts becoming much more cost effective. And, and so if the stormwater folks are talking to the planning folks and um, we, we adopted policy that kind of crosses these disciplinary areas, we'd really accomplish a lot more. Um, it's just, just a comment I wanted to make. <clears throat> um, my second thought is that that um, well, I'll just leave it at that. But but it was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, question for you: When you say a conversation about increasing soil volume, would that is is that in relation to the development ordinance, like requirements that would be placed on a developer when they're yes, when they have to plant trees as part of their development project for street trees or vehicle use area trees. Um, building impact trees, landscape requirements, that there's a minimum soil volume that's provided to the trees um, so that they can survive longer and better um, and capture more stormwater and things like that. Um, I also wanted to mention that the uh, the area, the watershed that you were using, showing us today is also one of the areas with, with the uh, worst urban heat island in the city and the lowest tree canopy cover. Um, so there's a relationship between what you're trying to accomplish and our need to increase tree canopy to reduce that urban heat island. So again, we, we need to break these silos down a little bit. Yeah, it's it's all all interconnected. It is. Actually, and I'm glad you brought that up. That was why I asked Renee to be here today. Um, I saw this presentation at another meeting and uh, that was exactly my thought. And actually something I just wrote down was partnerships and how we can uh, try to help bring these pieces together. So I really appreciate Renee you being here and Phyllis again um, to talk to us about this. Were there any other questions? We're gonna have to move on with our discussion, but we'll try to keep this in our in our mind and see how we can reach out and work together. So really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you for all the work you're doing on the Thank you. on the Forestry Commission. Thank you. All right. Well, let's move on to staff reports. Uh, let's see, Mark was not here today. That's okay. He um, no, Mark was not available to meet with us today, but he did mention there was no major updates that he had for us at this time, but he'll catch back up with us next month. All right, thank you. Oh, and I just want to say uh, Zoe Boyle, Urban Forestry Commission member, made it. So just, <laughs> you want to say hi. Hmm. 
just try and <laughs> there you go. Oh, it's okay. If you're on mute, it's all right. Um, so the next one is the DSC TPO report. Nancy included updated information in the table that we can see here. And as far as updating the metrics, um, that's on me. I've received feedback from the group about what we want to see in our metrics wish list, and I just have not had a chance to compile that and send it on to Nancy and the rest of the city folks. So I will do that, I promise, by our next meeting, and we'll get some information on that. But any questions for Nancy on the tree protection ordinance metrics? All right. On to old business. So our working group updates, we're going to start with the policy working group. We've had a couple meetings, uh, I think a couple since our last meeting. So um, I don't know, Ed or anyone else wants to share and uh, update us. We're working on um, revisions to the tree protection ordinance, um, ongoing discussions of chapter 20 revisions, and then the um, planting standards that Ed mentioned are ongoing work as well. Do you have any other specific updates, Ed, that I'm missing? Uh, not not really. Um, the conversation regarding the revisions to the canopy amendment are going forward and in a positive direction. Um, we started some initial discussion about the inclusion of heritage trees in that amendment, which I'm very encouraged about. Um, the uh, landscape code group is now focusing on parking lot tree planting standards, uh, canopy standards, and um, <clears throat> That's a good discussion. Um, that's all I have to say, I think, at this point. <laughs> Sharon? Yes, um, Bedilla, um, because I responded to TRC on comments, uh, Bedilla sent me, and I sent it over to Ed, because I had to print it, um, the Tree Canopy Preservation Ordinance proposed updates. And on certain developments, I've made comments that he's responded back to on changing the percentage, as Ed says, counting sticks in the ground as opposed to tree canopy. And he's giving me uh, examples of if we would change our methodology into uh, critical root zone canopy as opposed to uh, the size of DBH uh, um, and uh, mature spread. And so I printed it up, it's about 10 pages to look at. And this has been specific to uh, my responses to certain developments that are coming through. And um, I'll probably talk more to him about it, but it looks like it, it's a, a change that is workable and doable as, as Ed says, uh, counting sticks is not as effective as actual critical root zone and canopy. So this is where he's leaning, and, and it's a good uh, uh, it's good uh, thought process that he has done on this, and I just need to wade through it. So FYI for everybody. Okay, thank you. All right, any questions on any of that? Uh, Chris, go ahead. Hey, I just want to chime in. I'm unmuted. Good. I chime in on that. That's um, what Sharon's talking about is what I've scheduled a meeting with the policy working group on Friday to discuss. Um, there are some potential problems with it to be aware of and, and some issues to work through. So we just, that's why I set up that meeting so we can kind of dig into that. So um, I'll look forward to talking with you all on Friday about that. All right. Thank you. All right. Anything else on that one? All right, well, we'll move on to um, budget request working group. So since our last meeting, we have heard and now seen the city manager's proposed budget for the upcoming fiscal year that currently does not include any funding for an urban forester or an urban forest master plan, unfortunately. So we have a moment in time right now to continue pushing for this particular budget cycle. The next meeting of the city council with public comment, a public hearing on the budget is June 14th. That's next Tuesday, um, I believe 5 p.m. if I'm not mistaken. And that'll be um, in person, I believe still, I, have, I just checked this the other day and I forgot, at the Harris Cherokee Center, um, if we can have people present for public comment. So the um, budget request working group was 
sort of, you know, working on some ideas of how we might be able to have a coordinated response um, in person at that meeting. So we can discuss that. Um, I see that Kim Roney's here. If you have any other um, updates for us before we talk about our response, that'd be helpful. Nope, you are correct on all those points. Um, it'll be Tuesday, June 14th. The meeting starts at 5 p.m. and that will be the single um, public engagement on the, the city's draft budget um, here at the final hour. Okay. And yes, it will be at the Civic Center. Perfect, thank you. All right, so um, unfortunately Patrick isn't here today. He wrote up a list of talking points as well. I will not be able to be there personally at that meeting. Um, so I wanted to just see if we wanted to create a plan or work together as the you know, budget working group or if people you know, if in this group, if commission members knew they would be able to be there in person, we could sort of have a spin-off group that could meet between now and then to coordinate talking points. So I just wanna open it up for discussion and ideas for how we go from here. So go ahead, Dawn. Thanks, Amy. Um, I will be there in person. Um, it's also the, as Phyllis um, mentioned earlier in her presentation, B City USA, which is part of Greenworks, um, will be receiving a proclamation for pollination celebration um, for the month of June at the beginning of that meeting. So I will be there anyway. And I think it's important for us to make a strong showing at this. So I encourage anybody who is available and who can make it in person to join me and we can coordinate our comments together. I'll also be putting out a call to the Tree Protection Task Force. Um, there was a blurb that went out in our Greenworks newsletter on Sunday and um, asking people to contact city council. Um, one point I wanna make is that it's, we're like way beyond the point of making the case for why we need an urban forester. Like that has been made countless times. If people don't get it, they just don't get it. But I think everyone does get it. And you know, three years ago or four years ago, it was this, the city council at that time approved um, unanimously the need for an urban forester and an urban forest master plan. And it's just not been funded. Um, no funding has been allocated in each budget cycle. And after each budget um, is approved and there's no funding, we as the Tree Protection Task Force and Urban Forestry Commission have put our heads together, have talked with people, city staff, city council members, and been advised on how to proceed. And we followed all of those um, words of advice to no avail. And so it's extremely frustrating. I think you can hear that in my voice. Um, I, I'm tired of this and I think we need to um, hold city's council's feet to the fire on, on providing funding for this. Um, it's, it's way beyond time that we had an urban forester on staff in the city, you know, across the state, all these other cities have um, urban forestry programs or urban foresters on staff. And there's no reason why Asheville, who claims to be a leader in sustainability, does not have an urban forester. So I'll curtail my comments. Uh, please join me. Um, oh, one more thing I wanted to say is that the when uh, the urban forester position is proposed and um, city council as a whole, um, response has been not not any one individual that I'll point out, but it has been well. What positions are you going to cut in order to uh, provide funding for the urban forest? And I think that's a really unfair argument to make. Um, it's not our job to uh, find funding for this city staff position, and it's also not our job to cut positions or suggest which position should be eliminated. That is the city manager's job and the city council is job is supposed to be to instruct the city manager on how to proceed. So mm -hmm. that's the uh, case that I'll be making next Tuesday. Thank you. Sharon. Uh, good points, Dawn. Um, 
Are we under the rules of uh, three people for a nine minute presentation, Kim, and the budget when we talk? Is it the same as public comment normally is? It would be the same as public comment. However, um, unless there is um, an abundance of, of applicants for public comment, when, and I have seen that happen where um, time gets trimmed, um, the standard public comment procedure has been one person can speak up for three minutes or one person with three people, so four total, can request a 10-minute spot to speak as a group. And that four total is the person that's also speaking. Correct. So three in the audience and the person that's speaking. That's correct. Okay, so I think we need to have someone, um, um, and when we meet, we can discuss that. Also, as I stated, I think privately to Amy, I believe, um, and I don't know if it's true or not, but I think we need to show the city how it's fail, how they're failing in house to meet the needs of what the city is requiring, TRC, um, inspections, uh, all the specific things that the city thinks it's saving money by keeping it in house, as opposed to having a professional that's qualified to do these and to have people that kind of sort of know what they're doing, but not really. And I think we need to point that out. I see it at TRC, I see it at council, I see it developments. They're trying to save money, in my opinion, keeping it in-house where it's actually leaking and not really doing the job that they think it's doing. And I think we need to show how it's not working and it's not working in-house and hasn't been working in-house. And I think that's the impact we have to make because it's not the people that uh, we're losing or having to make for an urban forester, it's how the urban forester is fixing the problem and the city's doing it half-assed. And I don't apologize for my language, but I think that's a, formula, a formulaic process that we need to show them it's not working. Thank you. Don? Thanks, um, Sharon. When I was speak, Amy and I were speaking with Councilwoman Gwen Whistler. Um, she responded to that comment that there wasn't the expertise in house by saying, um, "Are you saying our staff isn't qualified, or they, you know, talking about the uh, of, of the of areas of staff that don't know, like the inspectors that just don't know what they're doing? You know, it's not." It's not the people um, and the upper levels that can't, they're overwhelmed. They're just overwhelmed with work. Adding one more thing doesn't mean they can't do it. They just don't have the time or the wherewithal to do it. And um, Gwen is on her last aspect and I understand she's got a vote in this, but being nice is not working, you know? And I don't wanna uh, infuriate people so that they don't see the need, but this, uh, I just, you know, I, I said what I need to say. So thank you. That's understood. Um, I think Ed was next. Yeah, I know it's it's hard to like continue to be nice, but we don't want to burn bridges either. Um, the, uh, the the thing to do, well, first of all, I want to say that you, you, it, the proof's in the pudding. Why on earth do we have volunteers doing the work of the city um, in TRC? I mean, it, it's just, you know, you can't argue against that. That, that proves that the te technical expertise may not be there. Um, and that's not faulting the city at all. It's just that with respect to urban forestry, things have gotten a lot more complicated and you need that professional expertise on hand. So, so there's this draft job description that's uh, I've been floating around that lists a list of responsibilities that this position would do that nobody in the city is doing right now, that is really something I think that would be valuable to focus on. Um, that and the fact that there's opportunities to break some silos down across departments so that we can start integrating a lot of these practices with respect to stormwater and heat island, urban forestry, climate sustainability, all that stuff. Um, it, it, it's really in the city's best interest. And if we can take that positive note, it would be a missed opportunity and it's going to cost the city more in the long run to not fund this position. Um, I, I, my feeling is that's the approach we need to take. 
Excellent. Uh, I'm just going to add on to what Ed just said. The urban forester, as far as a benefit, can also work to leverage uh, things like grant funding and other partnerships that are available. So it can, again, save money um, potentially down the line. So Kim? Um, first, I just want to say um, thank you for navigating the complexity of the conversation that we're dealing with right now. Um, I think this group is so very capable and necessary in this moment to address simultaneously the urgency of the climate crisis, which the city has stated internally, um, while also saying thank you to the existing staff that you work with this, this group to also name your responsibility to um, address council and to advise council with that intentionality and that urgency um, while asking us to do our job. And I think, um, as I said, this group is very capable of doing that um, decisively, intentionally, um, not in the the spirit of the word nice, which you know can also mean like pushover, um, but to be firm and fair and clear um, that this is overdue and it is part of our meeting our goals and it's part of the Living Asheville Comprehensive Plan goals, weave it into the council stated goals, really calling us um, to do our job. Um, would be uh, my hope um, and my request of you, this group as your liaison. I'm happy to support you in any way um, that you can do this very important role. All right, thank you, Kim. I was taking notes for the group. Um, yeah, that's a perfect point, highlighting that city council has already approved all of this as priorities um, and the climate piece as well. So, um, is anyone else ready to say that they'll be able to be there in person? And so we can, I'll put you all in touch, um, Zoe. Yes, I can be there in person and I'm willing to support in any way I can. Okay, thanks. All right, um, then I'll start a um, thread as long as we don't have more than a quorum, we can put all of you all in touch um, to discuss the strategy and and how you want to set up the, the talking points for that meeting. And then we can encourage, of course, everyone else <laughs> to be there. It doesn't just have to be the UFC, um, like Don mentioned, the Tree Protection Task Force and others, uh, whoever we can bring in uh, to show support and mm -hmm. be beneficial. All right, any other discussion in this moment around this issue? We will see what happens and hope to have a different discussion at our next meeting, but for now, this is our point of urgency till next week, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, then moving on, the next um, item of old business is the Fee and Lou Working Group. Um, we don't have anything new in that arena. We last made the recommendation that the city spends the funds in particular on the Ravenscroft Reserve uh, location in downtown. Um, I made a note that as we continue to look into how the fee and loo money might function, um, the thought that came up in my head when Renee was speaking was how can, again, we build these partnerships and possibly use that money in ways that can boost existing projects, you know, things that can provide added benefit for green infrastructure, for example. So again, currently there's not a framework for that. So we'll keep meeting and seeing how we can assist the city with creating that framework for the decision-making with that. But did anybody have anything else on the fee and lieu piece? All right. And then lastly, the Urban Forest Master Plan Group. Again, we haven't met again since last time. We've really been focusing our attention on the budget request at this moment. Um, once we know how this will play out, then we can reframe how we might work on the master plan going forward. So. Anybody have any other comments or questions on that one? Okay. Next on old business is the rules and procedures update. And we do have a couple points of discussion there. Um, so hopefully everybody had a chance to look at the document. Um, apparently some of the um, places where we were looking for edits, it didn't really get updated in the working document. Uh, let me see if I can pull back up. Or Haley, you might have to help me navigate this, but just a moment. Let me pull up the 
last bit. Let's see. Do you, do you want me to pull up the draft? Yes, if you could, that would make it a lot easier. So I, I thought I had it here, but it's not on my screen. Thank you. Okay, I always want to start with a couple points that were brought up to me, and then we can open it up for other discussion. Um, Haley, if you could please scroll down to where there's like a box with a numbered list. All right, here. So first of all, in number seven, it says to defer consideration. Um, so it's so that everybody knows this um, draft was a product that was pulled, you know, as something that uh, groups like us could then manipulate, like change for our needs. And so we can see in here that in number seven, there's that uh, in brackets, 100 days. So this is something where we should discuss if that amount of days in this item is what works best for our group. This is referring to, um, you guys can read it, but if a motion has been deferred, um, how long till it you know, comes back? So I was suggesting that for our purposes, this doesn't need to be so long, 100 days. I was suggesting more like 30 or 60 days. Um, so if you guys wanna take a moment to read it and see if there's any um, other suggestions. My take is that 60 would be plenty. Yeah. Okay, Sharon? Yeah, I was going to say the same because we have the motion. We can't discuss it because uh, at that meeting, then we have to discuss it at the next meeting, and then we can vote on it that at the 60-day meetings. That makes sense and how that would work? I believe that was my reading of it, yeah. Yeah. So I, I agree with the 60. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Haley, I don't know if you want to take notes on our changes or. Um, let me get the editable version pulled up if I can find it. I think it's been shared with me. Um, or I can take some notes here and maybe I'll get together after. So, uh, so 100 to 60 days. I'll try it this way and then we'll, we'll get together. Um, so at this point, if you could just scroll down then to, I think it's, oh, go ahead, Ed. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was going to suggest rather than having a number of days, um, just uh, maybe put in within two regular meetings of deferral. Um, so what we're doing is giving ourselves two meeting, two regularly scheduled meetings to discuss the motion before um, before it expires. Rather yeah, than because of month because of month length, it could be more than sixty between two meetings. Right, right, or less. Well, that's true. Okay, let's see. So, emotional has been emotional within two regularly scheduled meetings would then be the yep. rather than a hundred days. Okay. So, for our purposes, that's what I have down as the change for number seven on this page. Thank you. And then if you scroll down to, I think it's number 17. Oh, no, hold on. Back up. Uh, number 12. There we go. So this is very similar. So to revive consideration. So the board can vote to revive consideration. So if we had deferred something, we can bring it back, but do so within another period of time. So we can, um, I think the suggestion here from Patrick was, let's see if I can find it, to be 30 days or, I'm sorry, I don't have this ready. There we go. Oh, no, not that one. Okay. So this one was, let's see, oh wait, number, sorry, it wasn't number 12 that you guys were working on, it was 15. But we can look at this one here while we're here. So do we wanna change this to something similar as far as our meeting cycle to something like two regularly scheduled meetings? Mm -hmm. 
Does anybody have any other comment on that one? Nope, that's good. Okay. And sorry, then Haley down to number 15 was the other one. Okay, there. So was, wasn't there a question about number uh, 13? Oh, let's go up. Uh, um, Patrick raised. I think Patrick's was 15 here with the six months. Okay, okay. Because I finally I found his message here. So number 15, it says um, the six months. And instead of that, let me look at this, the wording here. Okay, so this is to prevent the reintroduction of a failed motion. So if, if we overall vote against something, it could come back, but we don't want to come back right away. So what's the period of time that it cannot come back? So to be adopted, the motion must receive affirmative votes. Um, and if the motion is adopted, the ban on reintroduction remains in effect for a period of time or until the board's next meeting, whichever comes first. So the six months doesn't necessarily mean anything to our organization <laughs> because we tend to meet more regularly. So do we want to change that to um, just took out the number of days and just say until the board's next meeting. Mm -hmm. That was the edit that Patrick suggested. Mm -hmm. Any questions or suggestions? So the wording would be the ban on reintroduction remains in effect until the board's next organizational meeting. Does organizational meeting that's like when we restart at the at when we have a, a vote for a new chair and all. Is that what the organizational meeting is? I don't believe. I, maybe you're right. I don't know. Or is that a regular meeting? Um, yeah, that that piece. I mean, next meeting of the organization. Oh, good point. <laughs> ah, okay. So this is saying that the intention it looks like of this would be to exclude a failed motion for a much longer period of time. So the question would be how long would we want to exclude a failed motion? Yeah, that, that's the way it reads to me. Good, good point. So what would people prefer? You know, do you want a failed motion to be able to be reintroduced at the next meeting? Or should there be more of a cooling off period, if you will? I, I think at the next meeting, I mean, 30 days is enough to get more information that might get you to the two thirds membership to mm -hmm. um, reintroduce something. Okay, any other discussion? So then the suggestion is rather than any of that, the ban on reintroduction remains in effect until the next regularly scheduled meeting. Well, Instead of organizational regularly on a, a failed motion. Yeah. So yeah. somebody made a motion, we voted on it, and it's been um, not approved or correct. Right. So it seems like if if there's a motion and we decide to table it that till the next meeting, that's different from it failing and then reconsidering it. Like I just th think that we could get caught up in hearing the same thing the next you know the next month. In the next month until it passes um, if something fails and, and folks aren't happy about it. You're right. And that's the intention, I believe, of this number 15 is to keep something like that from coming up every month. So the question right. is... Yes, I think that we should do the, the six month. So keep it longer. I think so. I, I, don't, I don't see what the point would be. If we get to the point of voting on it and it doesn't pass, then I don't think like by the next month, it's a larger problem than than just tabling something because there's more questions about it, having more time to consider. That's a really good point. We do tend to um, agree on the substantive issues. That's true. So something that fails is uh, is is unlikely to change. I, I agree with Ed that we could learn more in a month, but on the other hand, would it, I mean, if, would it, would it really change if, wouldn't it be more likely we would introduce amendments at the meeting 
or, or modifications of the language at the meeting till we got to an agreement because we're all on the same side here mm -hmm. with almost everything. And with almost everything, good point. Sharon? Isn't that kind of what happened with open space? And yeah, then that's a scenario you could imagine where we were kind of closely divided. So say it had failed rather than passed, how soon can we re-examine that exact same thing? Well, well, originally it did fail and we didn't have the two thirds majority to reintroduce it. Um, mm -hmm. So that's how this provision would have made a difference. Exactly. And, and then we changed the language though. So it was a new, uh, uh, yep. It was, it wasn't substantively, it was the same. But it was still new because the language was different. So, I mean, we could have had that conversation back and forth. So I'm I'm thinking of all the years that I've been sitting on this, that's probably the closest we've ever come to having this type of scenario was open space. Mm -hmm. Would something like three months be a more appropriate middle ground if a group like this couldn't agree on something. It doesn't come up right away, but if a, a failed motion were to be reintroduced, would that be a more appropriate timeline to reconsider it? Something like that. Well, I like the one month for the simple reason, if I'm gonna use open space as an example, is that there was a timeline to get it to um, at that point in time. And I felt that there needed to be more discussion because it had to get to planning and zoning, et cetera, et cetera. And we would have missed an important timeline, whether it passed or failed. So that 30 days kept us within the criteria of submittal for that particular instance. You know, that's the only one I can think of in the three and a half years that we've even come close to. Yeah, that is a good point for something that's time sensitive. What other discussion on this point? Because right now we're kind of both ways here. So I agree, it is rare for our group to have a wide disagreement. It sounds to me like most of the discussion right now is leaning toward making this the shorter end of the time frame. So just until the next meeting. And, you know, honestly, if this were something that came up every meeting, we could have another vote to amend these rules. You know, these are not um, unchangeable. I agree. So right now, that if, if um, yeah, if something failed and, and one of us wanted to bring it back up, I would guess that it would involve either new information or uh, some kind of substantive change, which would make it a new thing anyway, like Sharon was saying. So- And otherwise it would just fail again, potentially. Right, right. And I, I don't know if any of us on this uh, commission are mean enough, although Sharon, you, I know you can be mean, uh, yeah. mean enough to keep bringing it up and bringing it up and bringing it up, <laughs> you know, cut down all the maples cut down all the maples. Right, right. Okay, well, for right now, then I have the amended wording to be the ban on reintroduction remains in effect until next regularly scheduled meeting, period, to end that whole um, paragraph. Okay. All right. And then Perrin submitted a couple suggestions and typos. Okay, so Haley, if you could do me a favor and scroll back up to Article 2. This has to do with membership. There we go. So this was taken and adjusted based on what's in, you know, the governing documents of how our board is um, compromised or comprised. And so including Duke Energy, MSD. So we took this out because this is what's currently in the UDO. So um, Karen's note here was that, you know, is this the point where we want to make some sort of adjustment here because changing 
this, and I don't know if we can change this in here because it's in the UDO somewhere, you know, differently. But if we change the membership, it'll change the amount of people on the commission, which will change a quorum and how many it takes to be able to have voting. So is this something we want to look at here in this section? Ed? I think that this is really okay. Um, what Perrin didn't read was that these ex officio positions are non-voting members. So it really doesn't change any of the quorum rules. Um, the one thing I would question is whether Duke Energy should, and MSD should be voting members because they never show up anyway. Um, if we change anything, I'd recommend that Duke and um, MSD are non-voting ex officio which is the way I read this, and I hate to bring this up now, but the way I read this, that Greenworks, Duke, and MSD are all non-voting. No, I, the way I read it, it, I'll read it to you. Um, the executive director of Asheville Greenworks, a representative of Duke Energy, a representative of MSD, shall serve as ex officio voting. Voting, oh, there it is, yep. Right, so what I would do is, is um, keep, Asheville Greenworks, since they're at, you know active participants, Correct. as an ex officio, or maybe just a permanent member rather than ex officio, and make and just eliminate Duke and MSD. I mean, I, I don't know why they're in there. Yeah, um, and we've had this discussion of you know we want to include them. You know, if they would come, it would be ideal, right? To, to have the discussion. So my biggest question is because we've talked about this so much is. If we change this here, are we even able to because it's in the UDO another way? Or, you know, do we go ahead and change it here as our hopes and dreams and then try to work on editing the UDO as well? This is a chicken or the egg discussion because we recommended changes in Chapter 20 where this is. Mm -hmm. And our recommendation was to eliminate Duke and, um, and MSD. Yeah. Sharon? So, I, I don't know. I'm learning that text amendments can be done. Um, that'd be somebody like Nancy or Chris can, uh, um, um, and that would be just a simple text amendment, not a change in the UDO per se, change in the UDO. But um, the more I've been involved in these city changes, um, the more I'm learning that a text amendment isn't that difficult. And that, that's what this would be, just a text amendment. So I don't think it's that complicated. We just have to get right. it into that process, whatever that looks like. Well, right. here's what I recommend in this moment is that we keep this how it is, matching the UDO, so that we can get through this document. And then separately, perhaps through the policy working group, we take up the issue of changing the text in the UDO, at which time we as a group can change this to reflect that. Does that make sense? Sure. Because we know this is an issue that we need to revisit, but I, I, I would personally wouldn't be comfortable changing it here, knowing that the UDO is going to override what's in here. Right, and to Perrin's point, uh, he misread this, um, thinking that the ex officio that are appointed in addition are are non are voting and they're not they're not voting. So yes, and that makes sense, and I misread it as well. So personally, I say we leave Article Two for now, and we'll have to revisit the membership issues separately right yeah and that uh, somehow frame it that it duke energy and msd are invited to to show up if they ever consider that they're interested yes <laughs> and actually I, I, on the side i've actually reached out to ben again to try to initiate the duke energy discussion it, separately because there were tree trimming issues that came up so still working on it you there. know, it, it does make sense after hearing the Riverlink presentation that they maybe serve an ex officio role since there's a lot of commonality. So that would be really nice. And, and that would kind of cross out the MSD thing because, mm -hmm. you know, they look after those interests to a certain extent. That's a good idea. Let's revisit membership as part of the, like a separate line item. Um, maybe as even, you know, I guess it's really old business, but perhaps new business at our next meeting and um, have a discussion on that. So for now, I think we keep what's in here to reflect the UDO. All right. And then um, parents' other points were just um, typos. Typos. 
Um, so one is Article 5A, it says rescued, which should be recused, and Article 6B, gregarious, which should be egregious. And so I'll make note of those for our edits. Um, so just so we know if we get to voting today, uh, we'll include, the, include those as edits that we'll vote on to approve. So any questions or other comments or anything that I found in here that um, we need to amend? Are we good? All right, and we still have. This is just a joke, but shouldn't things that are egregious become gregarious? I mean, wouldn't that be better? <laughs> right. Uh, how it gets to feel, that's for sure. All right. Well, if we are ready, um, I guess I can make a motion, right? Because I have all the notes here. So I move that we approve the rules and procedures as written with the change to box item number seven to read two regularly scheduled meetings rather than 100 days. Number 12, box item to read two regularly scheduled meetings rather than 100 days. Number 15, the end of the paragraph will end in until next regularly scheduled meeting. And the two typos, recused and egregious will be updated. Is there a second? Second. We can vote. Don? Oh, sorry. Aye. Sorry, I have to pause. We're supposed to have comment there. If there's any questions or comments in between. Okay, then we can vote. Sorry, Don? Aye. Ed? Aye. Sharon? Aye. Zoe? Aye. Cecil? Aye. Perrin is absent. Patrick is absent. Both count as uh, I votes, right, when you're, oh no, that's just if you're accused, if you're absent, you're just absent, I apologize. And I vote aye. So the motion passes. Ooh, so we have now that document ready. We'll create a final draft. I'll get with Haley. We'll send that out to everybody. And we can work on learning it and following it, which will be mostly on me. So I will work on getting up to speed on uh, what's in there and incorporating it as needed in our meetings. All right. Next item on old business is the boards and commissions restructuring. Um, I guess I'll take that one. So there is another meeting. I think there was a save the date that came out from the city. It looks like at this point, I haven't seen any new information that the city is continuing to move forward with the restructuring as proposed with taking all of the boards and commissions down to four groups. And then from there having an undecided amount of working groups that'll work on it from there. Um, as you know, we um, passed a resolution recommending the city does not do this as proposed and considers other options. So right now we're just keeping this on the agenda so we can continue to discuss um, how it's going and if there's any strategy for this restructuring. So Cecil, we can open discussion. Yeah, um, of course, when I attended that open meeting um, about it, um, the newspaper only quoted me as this is a bunch of crap, which it is. But uh, what it, what's occurred to me thinking it through, if the problem that's been presented by staff is that there's too much of a staff demand um, to, to attend all these meetings, maybe we don't need so many staff members at the meeting. I mean, we've had, I think, five today. And, you know, it's, if, if certain staff members, and it's not that they're not important, but if they aren't here and we have questions for them, the questions could be answered at the next meeting. We obviously need Haley to be here to keep us glued together. <laughs> but but if, if the stress is, is too many meetings, well, then don't assign so many meet people to the meetings. I mean, we are, the members are the important part of this committee, not the, not the staff that can give us little bits and points of ideas. So anyway, that's my thought. Mm -hmm. Sharon? Yeah, I mentioned that. That was mentioned on the pre-meetings with the, what was called the Jam Board, which is the post-its they use. Several people have stated this, but it's uh, so far nothing of any teeth have been integrated into our discussions. 
So I brought this up and you brought it up and a whole lot of other people have brought it up. So how that's going to work, we just don't know because they haven't come up with anything substantive uh, yet. So if we just keep saying that, then maybe it'll come a way to, to hear somehow to work that into the situation. They're not listening, in my opinion, but it's another discussion for another day, you know. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Ed. All right. Never mind. Sorry. I, That's fine. Um, it's not to say what I was going to say. No. Okay. <laughs> um. So I, I will be at the unless something comes up. They haven't disclosed the time of the next meeting. Um. But it, I've also been involved with sort of a just as a private citizen with a side group that's working on this issue, uh, sort of a collaborative effort to, you know, try to get the city to listen and try to find a different path instead of just pushing forward with this one and only idea. Um, so you may see information come out with my name on it and Sharon's been in that group as well. Um, just, I just want to make it very clear that we are participating in that just as interested citizens and our work on the UFC we use to inform our decisions with that group. But if you see information from that, um, again, it's at your leisure to join. It's not a urban forestry commission initiative. Um, but as far as keeping involved with it, I'll be sure to update this group as anything pertains as we learn more. So anything else on the restructuring? Okay. Um, we're getting really tight on time. Um, if it's okay, I would like to, I don't know if we have to move to, did we do this last time? I'd like to move to postpone the quorum and public discourse discussion. I don't want to shortchange that discussion in this meeting and wrap up to the last couple items. Um, is there a second on that? Second. That was the second, sorry, this mute. Okay, gotcha. Um, so real quick vote on that item, Dawn. Aye. Ed? Aye. Sharon? Aye. Zoe? Aye. Cecil? Aye. And I vote aye. So we'll revisit that one. Do take a moment to view the links of the policies that are included in the agenda before our next meeting. And the last item in old business is the recommended species list update. Ed? I think we can remove that from old business now. Um, there's really not much to talk about with that anymore. Okay, perfect. So we are updated on that. Yep. Sharon? I've got a question for Nancy. Um, I've had a couple of trees that have been uh, ash trees that are not, that have been removed on our current recommended species list that developers are using. Do we have this new list posted somewhere and the old, and the old list removed? Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. So the, the old list is removed. I believe the old list is removed. Okay, I'll I'll double check because I'm getting similar stuff being printed. I don't have like full control of the website. I so. know. Yeah. <laughs> but the new list, like our list that we updated last right. month, and added some of the. Um, added the link to the invasive species list um, is on the DSDs, is on DSDs websites under the codes, fees and or codes and ordinances and fees tab. I can send it to you. Oh no, you know, I looked I mean, up under the Muni code because under seven, I forget, uh, which ordinance number it is, it's listed. I think it's under 711.3, it's listed also. And that's where, I think that's where the ash trees and all the ones that we did haven't removed is, it's listed. But I'll okay. look and send you an email. I'll have to get, ask Chris how to get that updated in Municode. Cause yeah, he I think that's did that I'm for the tree ordinance. So, um, cause it just, we just didn't have it updated in Minicode. Yeah. Okay. That one's even real old. 
Yeah, no, I know. And I was wondering that when they were really getting old. all these trees. Yeah, so, and I think that's where I found it. So, okay. Okay, thanks. I've, I've sure. got to say that this is absolutely insane. From the time I became the uh, liaison to the Tree Commission uh, back in 2010, the Tree Commission has been working on trying to get this, as well as the as SACI was trying to get the, the planting list up, updated. 12 years, 12 years to to do this. I, I What? <laughs> and, and you who are more professional foresters than I am had the answers 12 years ago. You know? Well, and I think part of it actually, Cecil, to your point, is that it, it gets updated, but not linked correctly in all the places where there's a link. So by Sharon doing her background legwork and identifying those locations, hopefully then we can make that fix. Because um, yeah, I think we're I think we're almost there on that. So yes. All right. Anything else with the species list? All right. Last item on new business. So um, hopefully let's just take a moment, but um, some community members reached out about school tree planting and had noticed in our annual report that there was a mention about the Hog Creek Elementary School project and how we were able to coordinate with Buncombe County Schools on that particular project to help preserve and enhance tree canopy based on um, local residents you know, seeing the project happening and, and worried about tree loss. And so they reached out to me about a particular tree project at Herring Elementary in Asheville City Schools. Um, and all I said was that we would at this point discuss if in general, tree planting at schools, you know, working together with Buncombe County Schools and their maintenance programs would be something that the Urban Forestry Commission would want to consider as some sort of special project or a working group. I just wanted to open it up for discussion if that was something that we were interested in taking on now or some point in the future or what your thoughts and questions are about that. So if anybody wants to jump in, Don? I think it's a good idea for us to support um, or show our support for planting on public properties, including school properties. Um, the Asheville City Schools and Buncombe County Schools are both, um, their facilities are, are maintained and administered by um, Buncombe County Schools. So just so folks are clear on that. So there's, if you wanna plant on Asheville City School properties, you would go through Buncombe County as well as talking to the schools. Um, I think as a project for us to get involved in as a, advisory body. And I don't think that's the right place for us to operate. I think, you know, we have organizations like Greenworks who play that role in partnership with um, schools and, and other organizations to plant trees. We've done several tree planting projects in partnership with schools uh, on the school property. And I think it makes sense for us to play that, continue to play that role. You know, it might come down to, well, it would look good for the Urban Forestry Commission to lend its support in the form of a letter or speaking to some officials about the benefits of trees um, on school property, but I don't think we should organize a project. Good point that our role is to advise city council um, on work that could be done on basically city projects. So this might fall outside of our scope. And I, you know, one thing I would point out is the Hawk Creek project was a little different uh, because there was an existing construction project that fell under development services. And so that's the reason why we were involved in that specific project. So I don't think I agree that it's not like the role of the UFC is not to go around and say, plant trees here at this school or that school or or any location. <laughs> um, you know, anything specific like that. It depends on projects and how we advise city council. So Don? Yeah, and I would add 
other types of public properties to that, like uh, libraries and um, well, I just thought of another one, but I can't think of it now. Or oh, parks. You know, so there's, um, you know, several years ago, GreenWorks worked with the um, Parks and Recreation Department to come up with a a master planting plan for parks or put into place what it would take to create one. Um, so that sort of thing too, I think we could, as part of our advisory role to city council, when we're working towards a zero net loss canopy goal that we can encourage the consideration of planting on all city properties. And as Dawn pointed out, the school properties are directly under the Buncombe County uh, government. Not they aren't in any respect controlled by the city of Asheville. So um, I think we should focus our main advocacy on the urban forestry plan and the urban forester in terms of the city council. Correct. And city projects. So if a you know a specific development project came up that's where we could, um, you know, perhaps help with advising. And that's all we did at the Hog Creek project was provided expertise and assistance in coordinating discussions between the different groups. So, so it sounds to me, if I have this correct, oh, go ahead, Ed. Yeah, pulling the lens out a little further though, um, I, you know, the environment doesn't stop at jurisdictional boundaries. And Buncombe County um, it is, it falls short of any urban forestry policy at all. And it would be nice to somehow provide leadership to get the county to establish a tree board and help them, you know, navigate policy processes and make changes that um, that we're trying to make here in the city. I mean, it, it I, I think that you know that's we can, we can we can address some of these issues till the cows come home. But if Buncombe County doesn't take care of these same issues, we're going to have the same problems over and over again. So I, I don't know that maybe the opportunities for GreenWorks. I don't I don't know, but we could be a, a sister organization to a Buncombe County Tree Board. Yeah, so we Zoe, you're on mute. To clarify, the public housing properties, are those considered uh, Buncombe County properties? No, the um, housing authority properties are their own private entity. So, mm. yeah, they manage their own properties. And we've worked, Greenworks has worked with them quite a bit in the past several years to do tree plantings. So we've actually talked about as a group this issue with regional and countywide outreach before, and it's been difficult to create those connections. Um, I might suggest that that might be something that we um, work more with our advocacy groups, like through GreenWorks and the Tree Protection Task Force, to initiate those um, discussions you know, and maybe push in that direction. And if we get to a point where the Urban Forestry Commission could at least facilitate discussions, but we are not, again, advising city council to work with Buncombe County. You know, again, we have to remember that our role is that direction. So until we have something to advise city council on, I don't think it necessarily falls in our purview. Well, to add to what um Ed said earlier about the jurisdiction um, to, you know, all of the trees within the city limits of Asheville were counted in the canopy study. And regardless of whether they're on private property or a public property or who owns what, you know, if it's a school that technically Buncombe County manages. So um, when we're working towards a, a zero net loss uh, canopy goal, we need to be considering all of the trees on all of the different types of properties. And so in that sense, we can, that's where I think we can make recommendations, even if it's not city owned property, because it's the city's goal. 
That's a good point. So where do we want to put this? I'm, what I'm understanding is that we ne don't necessarily want to you know, create a task force or a working group in this moment to work on specifically school properties. But what I'm hearing is that we do want to continue with looking for opportunities to coordinate with various groups, including the county, including nonprofits, including you know, whoever we can talk to as far as um, making connections that would increase urban canopy. So I think we have the task force or you know, working groups set up to address some of those. And as individuals, we can you know, be looking for other ways to integrate, um, you know, like for example, having presentations with this group to, to make connections. So any other comments on that? Thank you, Kim. All right. Well then, that was it for our regular business. Does anybody have anything else to add? If not, we can take a motion to adjourn. I have one so thing, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yep, go ahead. Uh, I think Don. Um, that I didn't include in the Greenworks update is that we are partnering with the city to hold a workshop for um, developers and inspe city inspectors next Thursday, the 16th um, in the morning, 9.30 to one, I believe. Um, and we're having um, Scott Abla, who's a certified arborist, come in and go to a work site or sites to show um, folks participating in the workshop um, what to look for in terms of tree protection and um, um, what to, to notice that shouldn't be done and should be done and to talk about um, tree planting standards as well. Great. And then Ed, did you have another comment? Was that it? Okay. Then if there's a motion. So moved. There we go. Move to adjourn and a second. Second. All right. Let's vote. Dawn. Aye. Ed. Aye. Sharon. Aye. Zoe. Aye. Lisa. Aye. And I vote aye. So thank you all very much. We will reconvene next month. Thank you. Have a good night. Good evening. Good afternoon. There we go. <laughs>